Welcome back, and today's episode, I have 21 real sniper tactics you can use in Daisy. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Alex. I'm a former British Army sniper. I spent seven years conducting tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And in today's episode, I'm going to be showing you everything that I know that can be used in Daisy to your advantage when it comes to PvP. If you recognize some of these tactics, then use this as a remind and revise. And if you're new to the channel, consider hitting the subscribe button and leaving a like and a comment as this is the only way to show the YouTube algorithm that you enjoy this content. First up, we have dead ground. So dead ground, what is it? Dead ground is an area of the terrain that can't be seen from your current position. It can be created by hills, valleys, buildings, or trees. Perhaps it's because you're on a high feature, or maybe because that ground runs through a valley, meaning observation is impossible. You should be aware of dead ground as it will allow enemies to sneak up on you, and you can also use it to your advantage. Dead ground is an excellent place to place traps such as mines or bear traps. Placing these traps in dead ground means when an enemy attempts to flank you using the dead ground, they'll run into one of your traps, either killing them or alerting you of their presence. Next, we have intervisibility. Intervisibility is the best form of camouflage. Intervisibility is defined as somewhere visible to or from another area being mutually visible. In simple terms, it means can you see what you're looking at? It's the best way to hide from your enemy by putting something in front of you that they cannot see through, such as using dead ground. Placing a large geographical feature between you and the enemy will always suffice better than wearing a ghillie suit. Next, we have contouring. Contouring ties nicely into intervisibility. Rather than walking across the top of a hill, which skylines you, meaning you're nicely visible for people looking at you while the sky is against you as a backdrop. Instead, you should drop down to the side of the hill and walk along the side. If the enemy is on the other side of the high feature, you are now hidden through intervisibility. If they are on the same side as you, it still provides an advantage as you now don't have the sky highlighting you. Next, covered approach routes. This means using the covered approach routes via the use of dead ground. If you're in the dead ground, the enemy cannot see you. So when you're approaching a village, town or base, or when pushing an enemy, make sure you utilize valleys and re-entrance and to ensure you remain in the dead ground on your way in. Remain in the dead ground until the last possible second and then pop out and engage. Remember, you cannot shoot at what you cannot see. Next, we have loophole shooting. Loophole shooting is a fantastic way of keeping yourself hidden while engaging the enemy. Instead of positioning yourself at the edge of a tree line, meaning you're much easier to spot, try pulling yourself back into the tree line and looking for a small loophole to shoot through. This will make you much harder to see when firing, but still allowing you the same amount of view as from the tree line. Next, we have the one below movement. When maneuvering through Daisy, you are exposing yourself to enemy view, so you should employ the one below method. In basic terms, this means using the method of movement below what you think is acceptable. If you're walking, you should be crouched. If you think you can be crouched, you should be crawling. And if you think you can get away with crawling, don't even attempt it. Next, we have all engagements should be ambushes. The most effective way to engage the enemy is to treat all engagements as ambushes. This puts the enemy on the back foot immediately. Instead of getting into the idea that every time you run into the enemy, it'll be a fair gunfight, start thinking about how you're going to ambush the enemy. Fight on your terms. The way it should be is if you're shooting at the enemy first, it should be an ambush. Don't just open fire because you've seen them. Take cover, get yourself set up properly, and then engage. Next, we have hasty versus deliberate ambushes. A hasty ambush is when you bump into the enemy and only have seconds to get yourself set up. Quickly get yourself in a line, maximizing your firepower and engage, causing as much damage as possible. A deliberate ambush is when you find an enemy base and perhaps you want to set yourself up and wait for them to appear. This can also be used at heli crash sites. When conducting either a hasty or a deliberate ambush, you should wait until the majority of the enemy is in the center of your ambush. This is called the killing zone, allowing them them to enter completely into the killing zone gives them less ability to withdraw. Next up, we have fallback positions. When defending anywhere, be it a base or a house, never fight from your last position. If you're defending a house, make sure you have multiple fallback positions that you can move to if you're going to be overwhelmed. It's no good running up to the top floor and tucking yourself in the back room and fighting from there. Take your first position with eyes on the door so you can fight them on the threshold. If you're forced back, maybe go up the flight of stairs and hold them from the top of the stairs. If pushed back again, tuck yourself into a room. Always make sure you've got somewhere to go if you're going to be overwhelmed. 
Next, we have correct target indication. When giving a target indication, it's important to convey the information quickly and precisely. Rushing out what you're trying to say, making things confusing, is only going to get you killed. When giving a target indication, make sure you give it clear, loudly, as an order, with pauses, such as contact front, 100 meters, moving from left to right, one times enemy in the open. This gives your teammates plenty of time to process the information and get eyes on quickly and effectively. Next, we have the clock ray method. The clock ray method is used for when giving a target indication. It allows you to bring your teammates on quickly and precisely. To do this, we take a reference point, such as a building or a tower, and then we place a clock over the top of it. Then, from there, such as in the diagram shown, we tell the time depending on where the enemy is in relation to that clock face, such as enemy, four o'clock of tower in the woods. Next, we have the direct method. The direct method of giving a target indication is a way of bringing people on in the open quickly and precisely. Looking at the diagram, you can see the axis and the left and the right. Place the axis on your direction of travel and then use quarter left, half left, half right, three quarter right to bring on your squad mates to the enemy. Next, we have tick off features. Navigation can be difficult in DayZ. So, to ensure you're not constantly looking at your map, we use something called tick-off features to use as a sort of list to aid ourselves while navigating. For example, if you're moving down a track and you know you want to go to a building on the right-hand side of the track, look along the track and look for tick-off features you can use, such as, I know when I go past two left-hand turnings, the building on the right will be there. This allows you to use a list in your brain of the features you can tick off while navigating to stop yourself getting lost, but also to stop yourself from constantly looking at the map and allowing you observing your arcs. Next we have backstops. When navigating in Daisy, to ensure you don't overshoot where you intend to go, you're going to put in some backstops. A backstop is a feature that if you hit while navigating, you know you've gone too far, such as a river or a building past your intended destination. Use these combined with tick-off features to ensure you never get lost. Next we have standoff. Standoff is all to do with weapon distances. For example, ensuring that your weapon can shoot further than theirs and the damage you're doing is better than they are. You want to try and have your engagements so that your weapons are affecting them past their effective range. For example, using sniper rifles against assault rifles and using assault rifles against pistols and shotguns, for example. If you can get your engagement to happen within that standoff area, you're going to win every time. Next, we have factors to consider when stalking, or RED. When stalking, it's important to remember RED. This stands for risk, exposure, and direction. First off, risk. Is it worth tracking these people down? What's the outcome for me? What's in it for me? What do I stand to lose, and what do I stand to gain? Exposure as well. This means never overexpose yourself, and wait for your prey to expose themselves. Keep yourself hidden, ensure you've got a good covered approach route, and a good route to flee through, should things turn the tide and always remember to ensure your camouflage matches your environment and finally direction when you're stalking you need to have a good sense of direction you do not want to try and flank and then overshoot and end up in the enemy's lap you want to maintain that standoff and by doing that you need to have a good sense of direction next we have locate observe and then destroy locate observe destroy is a sniper's key role or find fix and then finish this means not just running around with a sniper rifle engaging everyone you see. Find them, watch them, and then, if it's worth your while and you have the ability, destroy them. Don't get into gunfights you don't need to. Next, we have unit of measure. When judging distance, a method you can use is the unit of measure method. This means, effectively, taking what you know and multiplying. If you know how far a football field is, multiply that by three to gain a rough estimate of the distance. This is shown in the movie Jarhead, as shown by this chief instructor. And just like he says, don't use your dicks, they're too small and I can't count that high. Next, we have bracketing. When judging distance, you can also use the bracketing method. This effectively means taking the minimum distance it could be and the furthest distance it could be and meeting in the middle. For example, if you're aiming at somebody and you reckon they can be no more than 300 meters away and then you could think they're no closer than 100 meters. That means using bracketing, you should aim roughly around 200 meters. Next, we have no movement without fire. When working as a squad and engaging an enemy, there should be no movement without fire. While one of you is moving, the other should be engaging the enemy. And when one of you stops, they should begin firing so the other can move up as well. Remember, fire without movement is wasteful, movement without fire is deadly. And finally, we have no-go versus slow-go. 
This relates to moving across the terrain. Slow go ground is ground that it's going to take you a while to get through, such as river features or poorly camouflaged areas. It's going to be slow going and you should factor this in on your push to the enemy. No go ground is ground that is going to get you killed taking it, such as vast open hills and big fields. Moving through this no go ground will certainly get you killed. And that's the end of the video guys. Hopefully you've learned something new today. And if you made it this far, thank you very much. Leave a comment down below on what you would like to see next and hit the subscribe button if you're brand new here and you've liked what you've seen. Here's to 2024 and have a good one. I'll see you in the next one.